Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and the last few days have brought a bunch of major events in space science. First of all, let's talk about uh, OSIRIS-REx, which has officially finished its first pass survey of Bennu and gone into orbit around the absolutely tiny asteroid. If you remember, after get arriving at the asteroid, it was going to fly back and forth several times, performing these surveys of the object and also trying to sense the gravity field so it could figure out how slowly it would have to go to stay in orbit. Bennu is the smallest natural body that has ever been visited and uh, rendezvoused with by a space probe. So orbiting is kind of hard. At 500 meters across, it is very, very light, doesn't have much gravity. So they took an eight second thruster burn, slowed its velocity, and it's now orbiting at a speed of about six centimeters per second in an orbit of about 1.5 by two kilometers. So this is the smallest orbit ever achieved and the slowest orbit ever achieved I believe around the lightest body ever. They announced a bunch of results about the structure of Bennu, you know, obviously uh, obviously they needed to know this to put it into orbit. It has a bit of an offset in its center of mass. They identified some craters where they will be able to sample it and some larger surface features. And this slow careful orbit insertion happened within hours of New Horizons screaming past Ultima Thule at about 14 kilometers per second. You could not imagine a wider contrast in terms of velocities. On January 1st, the team did have a press conference to confirm that the fly past had gone as planned and that uh, they did have this particular image that was taken on the way. And this is obviously smoothed from a much fewer, it was something like 16 pixels in total. But today they revealed this magnificent object. Okay, this isn't even close to the full resolution. This is a 140 meters per pixel, but it suddenly shows you something that's recognizable and there's a lot to see here. First of all, yes, it does look like a snowman. And yes, we jokesters on the internet had a jolly good laugh about this. Now, later in the press conference, they brought out the color image. Now, this was only 900 meters per pixel. It was taken with the Ralph camera. And of course, you can combine the low resolution color data with the high resolution luminance data and get, well, a pretty good idea of the color distribution. Obviously, this is kind of exaggerated colors. The thing is really kind of gray, but it was enough to let people realize that it's actually BB-8. Anyway, joking aside, what we have here is probably the best example of a contact binary, the most pristine example. Now, we've previously seen a contact binary, a bilobate object in the form of Comet 67P, Cherimus, or the, you know that one, right? The one that Rosetta visited. And uh, this one ha is much more unprocessed. The objects are much closer to being perfectly round. The larger lobe has a diameter of about 22 kilometers or thereabouts, uh, but the variation in height relative to a reference ellipse in this case is about one kilometer. So that's actually surprisingly round when you consider how non-round many small bodies are in the solar system. And this is much smaller than many of those. And, you know, to be clear, obviously the whole thing isn't spherical, but each part in its own in and of itself is a lot more spherical than even larger sized objects. And this is important because in if you look at planets and moons, the larger moons are the ones that have the gravitational fields to pull themselves into a sphere. You know, they either there's many processes that can lead to this. Perhaps they get heated up a bit inside and that weakens them. But these things, they're out in the outer edge of the solar system. They're much, much, much smaller than the 140 plus, you know, kilometer limit at which we start to see objects getting pulled into spheres. So these somehow formed in spheres and then coalesced like this. And importantly, whatever process led them to being so spherical did not have any influence on them after they coalesced, otherwise you wouldn't have this bilobate shape. So it isn't simply that the objects are so structurally weak that their tiny gravity fields can pull them into spheres. Now, I'm going beyond the press conference here, but I think this is possibly related to the formation mechanism out in the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt, where I think the objects tended to collapse in little clumps, and each little clump would form into a number of small objects that would be moving very slowly relative to each other. So instead of colliding at high speeds like the objects in the asteroid belt that produced these very irregular shapes, these would have just coalesced much more uh, gently, I guess, 
And I think this graphic from the press conference kind of describes this reason, this system, where you would take a clump and you would end up with a binary and then the binary would end up becoming this contact binary. But I think this same like local isolation process might also result in these relatively uh, spherical objects. But yeah, once formed as a binary, the tidal forces would, of course, slowly shed uh, energy from the system, and they would spiral down towards each other until they turned. And even from there, they've slowed down more, because 15 hours period that we've uh, got for it, that would imply a density of something like 0.2 grams per cubic centimetre, which is way too low. For reference, Comet 67P had a density of about 0.55 grams per cubic centimetre. And I think this image is a good one to bring up because, yeah, this is an object which clearly has two lobes, but this has been processed. It's flown near the sun, it's been jettisoning off material, it's been hit, I think, by the looks of things at quite high velocities, therefore making these craters. So this is a processed object, whereas what we have with Ultima Thule is much more pristine and unprocessed. Now, these images are all, of course, in normalized grayscale. That means they've you know, adjusted the brightness so we can see them. But really, this thing is a very dark object. Its uh, surface ver reflectivity varies from 6% to 13%. And what's interesting is the brightest parts, the 13%, is in that neck area. And the reason for this is because it's probably dust that has collected there. Because of the gravity field, dust that gets dislodged will tend to roll downhill and collect here. And when you have a lot of fine dust there, rather than, say, the complex uh, chemicals that have been subjected to radiation for, uh, for a while, then it's going to end up being brighter than the rest of the object. And yeah, just for comparison, the reds are very similar to the reds seen in Pluto's moon Charon. Near the North Pole, there is a, an area called Mordor Macula. That's not the official name, but it's the name they like. And yeah, the, that's formed by stuff that's being deposited there, and then it's been subjected to radiation. So radiation interacting with primitive organic molecules is creating a soup of chemicals referred to as tholins. And those are very red. This image is actually pretty cool because it also shows you a comparison in size between Ultima Thule and Charon. Charon has obviously been able to pull itself into a sphere because of its own self-gravity. But I think one of my favourite images from the press conference was this one, which showed how the occultation profile matched the, the shape. And if you remember, this was a bunch of telescopes, amateur telescopes, 14-inch reflectors that you can buy in, you know, not a cheap telescope store, but you can buy one of these and put it in your car and go and look at the stars. This is what they used. They had a bunch of these in different places and they looked at a star and waited it for it to for it to wink out as the asteroid or sorry as the object passed in front of it and this is the shape match this is the result so you can see how close the estimates were using essentially a few thousand dollars worth of consumer telescope hardware anyway there's going to be another conference at the uh, same time tomorrow and they're going to have some higher resolution images. We'll probably see some more stuff. One thing we haven't seen in this is we haven't seen any evidence of craters. There might be craters there, but the viewing angle, the light is basically right behind the camera. So you can't see the shadows that they might cast. And as the space probe moved closer, of course, the angle is going to change and we might get some more hints. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, but yeah, let, there's one other thing that I want to talk about that happened today, and it's actually perhaps one of the coolest. China's space program has been able to deliver the Chang'e lander to the far side of the moon. People keep saying the dark side, but no, it's actually light right now. It is the far side of the moon, the side where we cannot see. It actually landed in a crater called Van von Karman Crater. That's, you know, of course, one of the founders of JPL, but also, uh, you know, he was, a, I believe he was like the PhD advisor for the guy that started Chinese space program. A few years ago, they landed the Chang'e 3 satellite, and Chang'e 4 is basically the same design. In fact, apparently it was a spare that they decided to uh, make flight-worthy so that they could fly this mission. And, you know, they took this bold decision to do something that nobody else had done, to land on the far side in the radio shadow where you can't get a direct signal out there. So to do this, they actually had to put 
a spacecraft out at the L2 point to relay the data back uh, to and from the spacecraft. The Relay spacecraft was called Tichao and it was launched in May of 2018. So it sat out there for a while verifying it would work. They also launched a couple of smaller sub-satellites that would actually uh, included radio science experiments. Uh, many of the experiments are actually built by European uh, you know, scientists. So it is an international mission. There are actually rules that stop NASA from working with the Chinese space agency too closely. But equally, the Chinese space agency has not exactly been forthcoming with information as to what the orbits were or anything. And a lot of amateurs were trying to figure out where it was and when it would land. And the time it would land was actually uh, whittled down to when it could land in the von Karman crater because, of course, the moon is rotating. Uh, and if they didn't get it at a certain time, then they would miss it and have to wait another month. But in the end, it made it, and we uh, got some images from it. We're obviously looking forward to getting some good science from this. Uh, so Von Karman Crater is 180 kilometers across. It's quite large. Its bottom has been filled with lava at some point, which made it very flat. But it's part of an even larger crater. It's called the South Pole Aitken Basin, which is something like 2,500 kilometers wide. It's actually the deepest part of the moon, and it's the, it's got the, the lowest elevation and the highest part of the elevation, with a range of about 13 kilometers within it. Data from other spacecraft suggest its mineralogy is very different from the rest of the moon, so it's obviously a very interesting place to visit. But you know, none of the Apollo missions went anywhere near it, and uh, neither did the Russian sample return mission. So there's currently no sample of material from this area. Uh, the equipment that is with the spacecraft is going to be cameras and radar. So I guess they're going to get a close-up look, but they're not going to get you know fancy mass spectra or anything like that. Still, it's a big step forward, and I really hope that they release the landing video because we have this nice landing video from uh, Chang'e 3. So yeah, while we've had these three big events, we're going to have data and more updates coming out in the coming weeks. I'm just not going to get any rest on this front, I don't think. Oh yeah, and one of the more interesting sites of the Chang'e 4 spacecraft is that it includes a little greenhouse where there will be plants and, you know, insects and stuff which will try, will, they'll try to have them grow and live and, you know, exist peacefully together in harmony, forever dependent on each other in this hostile, barren world. They will become extraterrestrial bugs. Anyway, pay attention to the press conferences tomorrow because uh, they're just not going to stop. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.